participants on the phone here, it's all right? Okay, well welcome, let's get started. We think we have a few more clients in person that will that'll come in, but we'll get rolling here. Um, we appreciate you coming. Uh, my name is Nathan Larson. I'm one of the uh, project managers here, and my team are all of our project managers, which are all here right now, but uh, uh, we're talking, and we're talking about better ways that we can actually serve our clients here, and we talk about partnerships and partnering, and, and it's, a, it's a facet of, or a part of, of anybody's game plan at one point, unless you have a big, big bank account, or have access to a family member that has that and is willing to, to spend money with you on real estate. Everybody has to look at partnering at one point or one time or another in their game plan. They're, you're either gonna run out of a resource of, of uh, the credit or the cash, uh, and, and so that means that we come down to partnering. So we wanna welcome you, thank you for your time uh, and being here. Um, I just wanna introduce some of my team if, if we don't know everybody. My name is Nathan once again. Uh, we have Kirk Cummings. Kirk, could you stand up and Brad and, and everybody that we have here? So we have Kirk Cummings on our team. We've got Brad Stevie. We have Jason Covert in the back there. Uh, Kyle Sutherland, Rodney Beecham. Anthony Adlin is actually, I think, just finishing up with a client right now. Um, but but we, we consist of the project management team, or the coaches is what we used to be, used to be called here in the past. Um, so we actually take care of the clients as they come in as new PSA holders here at Strongbrook. And so we get the fun job of getting to know our clients, their objectives, uncovering their game plan, options for them, uh, things like that. So we are glad to, to be here. We're excited about what we do. We're not going to talk a lot about the why of real estate today. Hopefully you have that big picture and, and the reasons and, and the enthusiasm for actually wanting to be a part of Strongbrook and we're rolling forward with that. We just really want to start diving into partnering and kind of the big picture of that and starting to dive into the details. So we're going to start holding these meetings probably about every three weeks or so where we take the time to, to dive into some more specific details of, of partnerships and how they work as, as we roll along with these meetings. So. Just a disclaimer too, and, and we have to say this, that we're not CPAs, attorneys, financial advisors. We, we don't give legal or tax advice or investment advice. advice. Um, we are here to provide options and next steps and, and ways that you can actually you know, continue forward with your game plan and, and how partnering fits into that. So we really advise you to go talk to the certified professionals, um, check it out, look at those options, certify those. We'll talk about that briefly towards the, the end of our, our uh, our program. So, uh, Kyle, could you just click the space bar there? Um, you know, one of the big things about part, about Strongbrook, and this is kind of our our uh, strategy, is our, to create, grow, manage, and protect. And of course, when we're looking at partnering, we're looking in that, into that create aspect of, of real estate. Um, that's what we're going to dive into today. So. Uh, to get started, our outline for tonight, um, we are going to have uh, Rodney. He's going to take a few minutes just to go over the elements of partnering, the basics, how it works, how it puts together, uh, things like that. Uh, we'll take some time with uh, Kurt, who will talk about how to find partners and steps to partnering, which is always you know, questions that, that we get when we're talking about partnerships and so forth. Uh, Anthony is actually going to dive into and kind of take over from where Kurt leaves off and talk about business structures. How do we put the pieces together? What type of businesses do we look at? The, the, the agreements, the contracts, things like that. Um, and then Kyle will just kind of wrap us up with resources. Um, what kind of resources do you have when you're looking at partnering? And then uh, we have one, one client here, uh, Clint, who we asked to be here and we appreciate him, but he's actually just finalized or has close to finalizing yeah. an actual partnership that he's actually done as a client here. So he has a, a Phoenix property uh, down in Casa Grande and he's actually partnered with another Strongbrook client. So we just asked him to maybe share some, some of his experience and how he kind of fit together and, and worked that uh, towards the end of the meeting. Um, at which point we'll just kind of open it up for any questions and then, and then wrap things up. So without wasting any more time, we'll turn it over to Rodney and Ronnie can talk to us about elements of partnering. Perfect. All right. So, um, I'm really excited to be with you guys today. I'm just giving you my background. I have been, I'm the longest tenured project manager with Strongbrook. Um, I have been working with the company for five years, and 
in that time, I've partnered on about 12 or 13 properties. Um, I, or I, I should say I've owned 12 or 13 properties, and most of those were with partnering. I own four properties right now, and all of them are with partners. So I'm very fluid with this concept. It's really important, and it all boils down to there's three different elements to be able to make a deal happen. Now, if you know, for those of you that have done your own properties already, you've had the experience of using your own money, using your own credit, and going through the process with our team to get your own property. So you have all three of these elements. But like Nathan said, at some point, we're gonna run out of certain of these things. It doesn't even matter how rich we are because we all have limits on how many homes we can finance on our credit, for example. So when we hit that limit, that's where partnering comes into play as it means to accentuate our game plan and, and develop it further. Now, um, let's talk about each of these uh, elements in, in isolation. So with money, um, you know, money's required to buy properties, obviously. Somebody needs to have the cash to put it down. And, and here we're gonna talk about obtaining properties with financing because that's the most lucrative way. We know that when we um, don't have to put you know the full amount into it when we can leverage using a mortgage we get a higher rate of return on our investment right so it's worth it to partner and you know to be able to get a higher return so with money um, the money partner is generally going to be something that's in a, a, a fairly stable financial position it means that you know they have a pretty good budget worked out with their family they you know that they they're not you know bleeding every month they're able to save a little and so so they have enough, they've set aside some money somewhere that they can use for a property, but there's some reason why they just can't qualify. It could be that they just change jobs and, and the way they're paid now doesn't let them qualify until it's been proven for two years. It could be a credit issue or something else, but um, for any, any number of reasons they don't qualify, so they're looking you know, for a credit partner. Um, and in this instance, the money, you know, money partners usually, like I said, they're, they're usually pretty, financially stable, they can probably, um, you know, sustain minor incidences with the property. They would be the ones to generally front, you know, uh, money if something goes wrong on the property. But this is all a negotiation point with your partners anyway. But that's kind of the money role. The credit role is um, the one that will qualify for the mortgage. Now normally, normally we would think that uh, this would be, you know, pretty risky. But with our program, it's a lot simpler. And I'm referring to some old notes I made years ago, but still apply. Um, so, so with the credit element, um, you know, we're we're investing in a property, in a, you know, with a, a good margin, right? We're getting a better um, discount, and also um, the the money partner is the one putting down the money. The property, not the credit partner. So there's not that much risk to them actually. And the management partner is the one that um, is is the one that handles all of the busy work type details, and um, and has access to Strombrook power team, which is all of us here and everyone else that works here. Um, can you please put your phones on mute? Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, now now the last thing I put up here is excitement because let me ask you this: How many of you know people? that have extra money in one account or another, and they're not very satisfied with, with return on that money. Anybody know that? I think we all know of, of a few people that, that could use a better return on their money. How, how many of us know someone or is someone who can qualify for a mortgage, okay? Someone that just has a steady job and, and decent credit, and those are that's all you need. And you, as a stronger client, you have the resources to put that together this is why I've been so much partnering over and over. It's very easy. You just find the elements, you put them together. Let's dive a little bit more now into the risk and implications for each of the partners. So, the money partner now, when, when you're, yeah. Somebody's calling. They can't hear. Can you, can you try to down who's to mute all? You should be able to mute them. Can, can you mute and, and mask or something? Yeah, yeah. I, I can't. Uh, whoever's on the line, can you please mute your phones? Um, the others on the call are able to hear. Okay, I might just have to stay closer. I'll just stand over here. Ask if they can hear you right there, Rodney. Okay, I think it's good enough. Whoever okay, else mute great. This, so, thank you. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so the money partner, they've got money that has an opportunity cost somewhere. An opportunity cost meaning that they could use it for something else. 
but they've chosen to put into your property with you. So the first thing you need to decipher is where is their money now and what are their expectations for partnering with you? Um, for example, if, they, if their money is in a savings account, they're getting half a percent a year versus in a you know, high performing mutual fund, you know, not that they're all high performing, but you know what I mean? Like you, you need to know where the money's coming from so that you can negotiate with them based on, um, based on you know, what will be mutually beneficial for them to get a good return on their money that's invested. Um, with the credit partner, um, it's, it's really just you know, kind of whatever, um, whatever you negotiate with them because there isn't really an arbitrary figure. There's no opportunity cost for credit. Um, if, you, you know, if your credit isn't used for property, it's just sitting there dormant. So, uh, so that's kind of up to you. But generally, um, our clients can negotiate one with another around 20, 25% or so is kind of what they tend to attribute toward credit, 20-25% um, of the total deal. But when you're, when you're talking to potential partners that are not stronger clients, you're not you know, bringing up, hey, I think you all have this percentage, you have this percentage, et cetera. Another way that you can also um, work with the money partner is actually getting a, um, a private money loan from them where they wouldn't actually be a partner, but they would lend the money to you at a fixed interest rate, and it, you know, generally between six and 10% per year. And that way you're making payments back to them. And the, the nice thing about this is that if, they're, if the property is more lucrative, then you make the difference and they don't actually have ownership of the property, but it's nice for them also because they don't have to have, you know, peace of mind or confidence in the system of investing that you have, you know, you as a, as a you know, as a client, you've obviously, you know, developed some level of confidence in what we do here because you chose to come aboard and someone else may not be quite that confident, but they can still get a return and trust in your integrity and not have to rely so much on the real estate. Um, so let me just check my notes see if I forgot anything. Um, it's also different whether you're going to um, use, um, uh, you know, someone inside of Strombrook versus outside of Strombrook. You know, because inside of Strombrook, we all have access to the same power team, and it's great we can help each other out. One thing I did f forget to mention is that when we talk about money, credit, and management, you can split this up a number of ways. You could have multiple people putting in money. You could have the management split up. Um, and when you're partnering with someone outside of Strombrook, the, your um, PSA carries a much greater weight because it's exclusive to them, right? And so it's gonna be, uh, allow you to have that full management uh, share of the profits. Um, and it also makes a difference in negotiating whether the property is a local one that you're managing with compassionate financing. That is an extremely specialized um, so the program. It used to be our bread and butter, now it's something more rare. And so that's something that you know you can look into with your project manager if you're interested. But most of what you do will be out of state, and those don't require as much oversight from you, um, you know, because we have teams in place doing all the work for you. But if it were local, then you know you would be um, doing more of that work, and you would need a higher percentage for that. But that's an opportunity in case you have a neighbor that's troubled about their property and needs help managing it, and you can provide a solution. Um, the last thing I want to mention is, um, again, think about how simple these elements are, and you are unlimited your potential to create partnerships. You can do it again and again, and it's great that you're here, and I'm excited to see what, um, what good comes of this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rodney, and thanks for that trial and error thing so we know where to stand so that the people on the phone can hear us. Well, welcome. I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking about how to find partners. And this is something that can maybe be a little bit intimidating for people. Maybe you're not as outgoing as the next person around and you think, this might be too hard for me to do. But it actually can be a natural outgrowth of some of the things that you're doing. So let me ask, just by show of hands, how many people, in addition to being PSA holders, are also IBDs? Okay, several in the room. Very good. Um, you're already out there working as an IBD, and you're filtering through some people that you think might have interest in, in participating with Strongbrook as PSA owners. When you're talking with those people, if they determine that this is not something they want to do, they may have a variety of reasons for not participating. 
it might be the upfront cost, it might be time, it might be them thinking of the work that's involved, a lot of things that might hold them back from wanting to be a PSA owner. Well, why go through a second process of looking for somebody who might want to be a partner? Why not just take the people that fall out from being potential PSA purchasers and talk to them at that point about what would it be like if you were a partner? We can get you involved in this whole process and help you begin moving forward and developing uh, asset value in your real estate. And you won't have to participate as a PSA owner. You can come join with me and partner with me. So it's a very natural outflow of one set of marketing efforts that can spill over into uh, the p potential for them to be partners with you. So there's one way to look at it. The other one is with your current sphere of influence. Look around you. You might be involved in business associations. You might be involved in church activities or civic uh, organizations. You have neighbors. You have friends. You have family members. All those people are potential partners that could join with you and participate in this whole process of building wealth. And that's what we want to do. Approaching them can be as easy as casual conversation. When you get together in a group, uh, you don't hit somebody over the head with a two by four and try and get their attention to see what you're doing. You talk to them about what benefit this program has been to you to this point. So if I'm, Clint, if I were to see you in a social setting and say something like, Clint, it's a long time we haven't talked. What are you up to now? Well, I'm buying real estate. You're buying real estate. <laughs> I'm good for you. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I, I, I'm associated with a company called Strongbrook and they've uh, taught me how to, I didn't think I could afford it. Uh -huh. And they've shown me ways in my game plan that I got through them how to to do it and I'm doing it. And they've uh, lined me up with partners and um, I've got, it, part, finding partners I've found is easy actually. So. And it's really a natural outgrowth of conversation. Yeah. In a social setting, isn't it natural for you to ask about them and them to ask about you, perfect opening to say something about what you're doing and see if it piques their interest. So it's really not that difficult and once you do it a couple of times, it's not that intimidating. It's actually easy to talk to people that you're friends with. Um, now, Rodney already touched on this. This third category of coming and, and partnering with other Strongbrook clients is a little bit different. In these first two categories, if you're an IBD, or if you're looking in your personal circle of influence, those people will not have access to the power team through the PSA that they've purchased. So that asset that you own is extremely valuable and will help you to negotiate a better position in the partnership than the third option. Now, each of the project managers in here, you're each working with one, uh, has access to this partnering list. And we know people who have cash and are looking for credit, who have credit who are looking for cash. Some people might have half the cash necessary and they're looking to partner with someone else who also has half the cash. Those people can come together and they can form a partnership and they can move forward with their individual game plans. The difference is in this third category, that negotiation process for access to the power team is going to be more open to each partner wanting to have a piece of it. And so as you look at that, just be aware that if you have the ability to find somebody outside of Strongbrook, you will be able to get a bigger piece of the pie. Somebody within Strongbrook, you're going to have to share a little bit more of that with them in order to make that happen. Okay, next one, Nathan. Um, so <clears throat> when you're looking for partners, what are the primary things you need to look for? Uh, well, we've mentioned a couple of them. We'll cover those a little bit more. but the First one and primary and foremost one on this is trust. Um, if you are going to be involved with somebody for a period of four or five or six years in a partnership, you're forming a business together, you're going to be business partners, it is vital that you trust that person. Now, uh, Anthony, just out of curiosity, when you meet somebody brand new and you are having a conversation with them, do you get some kind of a feel as to what they're about and, and who they are as individuals in the first two, three, four minutes of the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. There's people you feel uh, comfortable around. There's people that kind of give you the willies. They say, all right, I want to 
I want to stop this conversation. Yeah. So generally there is a vibe you pick up from someone uh, yeah. very quickly. Okay. So that element is something that you need to be aware of in your own personal interactions as you're trying to find that partner. Is there a basis for that trust to be established between the two of us so that we can move forward and be partners uh, going on and helping each other to achieve our financial goals? And you can share in that. So uh, in addition to that, when you're going into a partnership, uh, let's say a partnership search, you need to know what you have in your quiver before you go out and looking for what's missing. So if you have been credit qualified and you know that you can get the loan, but you're a little bit short on the cash, you know exactly what you need. You're going after somebody that has the cash and for whatever reason can't get the, uh, get the credit qualification going themselves. And vice versa. Uh, you might have a, a pile of cash you want to get it to work for you like, like uh, Rodney mentioned. It might be in an account somewhere right now where it's not doing too much for you. If that's the case, uh, you want to get it out and working for you and growing. And so you know that you need to find somebody with a credit and income to make that happen. So uh, looking for them, key, key, key issue is, is establish that trust. And then from that point forward, all the paperwork and all the things you need to put in place in order to formalize that partnership, which will be discussed by Anthony, is something that will just follow naturally. Um, one more slide. Okay. Just a little bit of a heads up, if you are purchasing a property on your own and you have all the elements required in your own sphere of influence and you don't need to go to anybody else, that process from starting the search to closing the property typically can be a 45 day to 60 or 75 day process. It's going to happen in a pretty short period of time, all the elements involved. If you get involved in partnering, it's going to take a little bit longer, probably about a month and a half longer. And the reason for that has to do with the lending requirements that are uh, in existence in the lending community. If you, as a credit partner, want to borrow the money to buy a home, the money for the down payment needs to be in an account that has your name on it, and it needs to be seasoned. Uh, Nathan, could you just give a brief description of seasoning so that Everybody in the room and on the phone can get an idea of what that's about. Yeah, lenders, when you're when you're qualifying for a mortgage, lenders require that money that you're using for the down payment, closing costs, and so forth is actually, you know, money that you've had in your account for a while. Um, and so what what they do is is if you're in a partnering situation, uh, and this happens quite frequently. Thanks, Rodney. Um, they, they want to see two full bank statements where the money has just been sitting there basically. They don't want to see the money coming into the account or anything. And so they call that seasoning where, the, where they have two full statements showing that that money is sitting there. And then they define that money as yours basically and you're eligible to, to use that for, for lending. And usually that's 60 days or, or just over 60 days you know, for two full statements. Okay. So thank you. I appreciate that feedback. So. Uh, I, I recognize a person or two in the room. Victor um, has been through a partnering process. Uh, do you recall that leading up to that, uh, you had to get the money seasoned in order to make it work? Right, we had to put the money into an account for about two months. Yeah. That's how it worked out. But then after that, it went smoothly and uh, you were able to purchase the property. So that's the way it works. Uh, just takes a little bit of prep time to get to that point. Uh, so just in parting, uh, let me just say that once you get this seasoning in place, you found your partner, you trust them, you got the paperwork set up, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, and get the money seasoned, now you're ready to go out and look for properties, and that's where the fun begins. So is it uh, that it, it doesn't matter where, um, where the money was before, it's just going to be in your possession for 60 days? Right. Okay. And one of the protection strategies is to have it in a joint account. The money partner and the credit partner have their name jointly in okay. the account. Because um, that was my question. Okay. Was whose account would they go in? Because whose names is being bought in is the one who has the credit. Right. 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 All right. So they're not going to be both names on this. Both but names can be on the account. The account, but not on the mortgage. But not on the mortgage. Only the credit partner will be on the mortgage. Thus, we have to have it seasoned. Seasoned. Right. All right. Is there anything that else has got to be going on or happening during those sixty days that? You know, save time that we should get that over with also. You know, some of that will be addressed by Anthony when he takes his portion on this because you do need to set up your business arrangement. And so 
he'll talk to that and, and describe some of those things in more detail for you. And that's coming up in probably 60 seconds. Why would a non-strong brook person want a lesser or smaller piece of the pie? Well, it's not that they want it. It's just that they don't have, they haven't invested in a PSA. Right. They don't have access to the power team. Right. You have it. Yeah. And that's a valuable asset. So you're leveraging your asset of having that PSA because you have access now to the entire power team. So we can locate the, the real estate better than they ever could. Because right. A lot of people will look around Utah and say, we can't get that kind of return. No, not maybe, maybe not here, but there's other places you can get that return. Right. They might not be it, budget. It, it's also because the rates of return that our clients can achieve is typically a lot higher than you know other investment vehicles. You know, historically, what our clients have achieved is way higher, and so people that aren't familiar with our company aren't expecting a very high rate of return compared with what oh, we can achieve. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you went to them and said, "Buy a PSA, you can earn twenty-five percent annually on your money combined between cash flow and equity growth," yeah. and then you want to partner with them and offer them eight or ten or twelve percent annual growth that might sound a little bit less impressive to them. So you have to gauge that, and that becomes a negotiation. So just in closing, I'm gonna wrap it up. I will tell you that I have uh, been working here for a little over two and a half years. When I first came on board, I wanted to get a property, and I wasn't able to on my own. So I had a client that had some money but couldn't get the credit, sent me three of her people from her circle of influence, they couldn't get the credit. So I said, well, let me talk to my wife and see what she can do. And uh, her credit was sterling, she had the income, and so my client and my wife partnered and I ended up being the orchestra leader to put it all together. And so now, when uh, one of my clients says, Kurt, do you have a property? I can say yes. Uh, and we're doing it through the partnering effort. And the grand total of expenditure was, I think, $2.67 on our part because we had to mail some papers somewhere. So, uh, and we have a small stake in a property and we are seeing our equity grow. It's grown 25% the last year and a half, maybe 30%. So it's been very impressive and, and very beneficial to us. So partnering can definitely make more things happen than you could accomplish on your own. And Chris Crone, our founder, is partnered on virtually every property he's in right now. Eventually, everybody has to partner. Some people partner sooner. And uh, he has hundreds of properties and he's partnered with them, uh, partnered on all of them, and he's been able to grow and build his wealth in that direction. Is that because you can only have so many loans on your name yeah. once? You're limited by the number of loans that you can get on your personal name. And if both you and your spouse work, you can open that up and you can maybe double that. Uh, but uh, you're going to reach a point where you're going to hit that wall and you're going to have to partner. Yeah. Okay. If you partner with someone outside of Strongbrook, it's common that. Um, that you might just have one partner that's the money and credit partner. That's very common, and that's the most ideal scenario if you could find that. They they would be tapping into our management. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just saying I forgot to bring that up in, in my presentation. That's another scenario you'll encounter too. Well, so before we make sure that we cover this somewhere in here, I'd like to know how do we how do we protect each other? Okay. And how do we uh, instill trust in them? I guess that would be how it's protected. Right, right. And I mean, how do you figure out these ratios of you get so much and you get so much and I get so much or whatever? Is there a kind of a formula for that? There is kind of a formula and the perfect lead into that is for me to say, I finished with my portion, I'm going to turn the time over to I just Anthony. want to make sure okay. Yeah, those, those get covered. I'm going to turn the time over to Anthony. He's been a presenter for our company for many, many years. He is the second most seasoned uh, project manager here at the company, and he will answer the bulk of those questions, and when he doesn't answer, uh, we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Okay? Perfect. And it's Brent, right? Brent. Brent. Right. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> I appreciate the concern, because this is something that we can talk a lot about. Um, I'm not going to be able to do it justice in the time that I have tonight. So I'm just going to introduce some things and I'm happy to meet with anyone outside of this to make sure that we can focus on how to execute these items for you, okay? So as you look at starting out, you want to make yourself appear the most attractive you can to a potential partner, right? Um, one of the ways that we can do that is 
And you mentioned, hey, if I start seizing funds with someone, is there other things that I can be doing along the way to help, you know, minimize the, the amount of time that's needed to get going and actually shopping for a home, right? That's the end objective with all of this. So on the board, we're looking at partnership, partnership agreements, okay? Now there's a few things that we can do as far as setting things up and getting going. The first one can be that uh, I just decide to partner with somebody. We're not using an entity or an LLC. And so a partnership agreement is a basic contract that states what each of us are going to do. It's going to talk about um, ownership splits. And, and Rodney kind of talked about some suggested splits. Um, I think those work really well. And every partnership that I've helped create, uh, we've pretty much followed those same guidelines that Rodney's outlined. Um, so we're going to talk about part or ownership splits within the partnering agreement. We're going to talk about things like, um, what are your responsibilities versus my responsibilities? And this is something you want to make sure you're very clear about. Because anytime you're working with somebody, the more clarity we have, the more power we both have. Okay? If we're very vague about our responsibilities, now they can start to build some, uh, uh, some hard feelings in the partnership of, hey, you're not doing your share, or you're not pulling your weight for what you're getting paid. And so things like, hey, if I'm a credit partner, what am I agreeing to? Well, I'm agreeing to use my credit. I'm agreeing to uh, create a joint account, have money seized there. I'm agreeing not to touch that money for any other purpose other than for our property. Well, you don't get to touch it. It's kind of locked up, right? Well, I personally will have access to it, <coughs> right? That's one of the things that we build in the agreement is that it cannot be touched for anything other than the purpose of the property. Um, so what I recommend is a personal joint account that that money seasons in. And the reason why is because if it's tied to any type of entity, an LLC, anything like that, the bank's going to say, hey, well, what's going on with this entity? I want to see a little bit more. They want to do more digging. If it's just a basic personal account, that's great because it's very easy for an underwriter to say, all right, that's your money after 60 days. Okay? Uh, but that's one of the things we build in the partner agreement that the money cannot be touched. I'm also agreeing to that I'm going to provide all my documentation to my loan officer in a timely manner. That when they ask for things, I'm going to turn around and get back to it within 24 or 48 hours. I'm agreeing that I'm going to show up to closing and I'm going to do everything I can to get that property closed as quickly as possible. If I'm the money partner, I'm saying, hey, what's my responsibility? Well, I'm the one who's providing the capital. I might be controlling the reserve account, right? I'm the one monitoring uh, the expenses. Um, I might be the one who helps if we need to file, uh, at some point, make a mortgage payment, right? If we're in between tenants, or we just acquired the property and it's not rented yet, and maybe we have to start making some payments, maybe I'm the one that goes and handles that, right? Um, I might also be, if I'm the managing partner, I'm the one that's taking care of the setup of the partnering agreement, or the LLC. I might be doing the one who's going to control the bank accounts. I'm going to provide financial statements. I'm going to cut disbursement checks. I'm going to make sure all the expenses are paid, right? So we want to make sure we break down exactly what each person is doing. Now, we have lists that, that are very detailed that we can provide you with this uh, if you have any type of uh, question about what each person is going to do. Okay? Um, other things that we can include in our partnering agreement are things like, uh, how do I get paid? That's a big question, right? If I'm in a partnership with anybody, it's about, well, I guess let me ask, is anyone doing this as a nonprofit? Nobody. Okay, perfect. So we all want to get paid, right? So let's make sure we're clear. Do I get paid on the first of the month, the uh, fifth business day, the 15th, the 20th? Um, do I follow the traditional calendar quarter? Are we doing a monthly basis, a semi-annual basis, an annual disbursement? Right? We need to make sure we're very clear about that um, because if there's any, the fastest way you're going to have a, an unhappy partner is when money doesn't start showing when it's supposed to, right? We want to make sure we're clear about how those monies flow, when do they get there? Also things like, uh, you might want to put in a beneficiary agreement. If one of, one of the partners were to temporarily pass away, right? It's not temporarily pass away, <laughs> but uh, unexpectedly pass away, right? Does the, is there some type of family member that benefits from that partnership? Maybe we have to work with. Um, also, you're going to talk about the banking. Do we do double signing checks if, they're, if it's a local person or out of state? That could be kind of an issue because you're mailing checks back and forth that have to be signed. Um, those are the types of things that go into the partnering agreement, okay? Now, the partnering agreement would be more just if you're operating as a sole proprietor. Um, the sole proprietor is essentially where you're in business for yourself, right? And this is just two individuals saying, let's buy real estate together, okay? Now, 
The sole proprietorship is different from an LLC. As a sole proprietor, you have a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more freedom. The downside though is you have a whole list of liabilities about how you're not protected. As a sole proprietor, there's no state law protection. Outside of the real estate, there's no real tax benefit. And ultimately, there's no separation of personal business assets. Now, Brent, you asked the question, so let's just play it as my partner for a minute, okay? So let's just say you and I are in a sole proprietorship, just a regular partnership together. On the deed in that situation, we'd hold it in what's called tenants in common, where we're both listed on the deed together, okay? Now, let's say that our tenant sues us, right? They can now go after everything that we have in our partnership together. They can go after everything that I have personally and everything that you have personally. Is that what we want to have happen? No. Absolutely not. And let's just say we had a third person in the partnership. Now potentially everything that that person has can also be included in a lawsuit. So when we're dealing about partnerships, you can't operate as a sole proprietor, but it's not really offering you any type of protection. One of the better ways to do it then is setting up an LLC. An LLC is a basic business entity. One of the main benefits that the LLC offers is that it does offer law protection, multiple tax benefits, and separation of your personal business assets. Now, Brent and I were in a partnership together. Our tenant sues us. Maybe they might be able to go after the asset, but everything that you and I have personally outside of the business is separated and cannot be included in that lawsuit, okay? Um, so there's a lot of great benefits to the LLC. Now, if we go through the process of, of setting up an LLC, and this is one of the things that you can be doing while you're looking for a partner or trying to, um, as we're seasoning funds, we can get the LLC finalized and created. So that's one of the things that can be happening in that 60-day time frame. Um, mm -hmm. We have at Strongbrook the ability to help our clients implement and create their LLCs. Uh, we've had our attorney teams help with the operating agreements. We can help and do that, and that's something that is maybe a service to you, check with your project manager or check with anyone here on the staff and we'd be happy to get that going, okay? Um, with that, then the LLC operating agreement is gonna be more like your partnering agreement. This is gonna have those items that I just talked about, about what your roles are, how we're breaking down ownership, uh, distributions of, of capital. Um, those are all things that can be built into your operating agreement um, and we've done that with our clients where that's already included, okay? So the LLC is something that we, we recommend a lot for partnerships. In addition to that, there is one other entity that actually works a little bit better uh, in regards to how uh, partnerships are structured. Now, for those on the phone, I apologize, you won't be able to see this part of it. Uh, we can send you a diagram about this, but it's on the Series LLC. Now, Series LLC is essentially you have one name umbrella LLC. Okay, this is what has your tax ID number. This is what your registry, this is what's gonna have the main bank account. Um, but what you do now is with each property you own, you can actually create a sub leg or series underneath it. And these can all be partnerships. Each one of these sub cells or series have their own operating agreement that have to be created for that, where we can designate ownership within each of these. So I might be in a 50-50 partnership on one, I might own this one 100% myself, this one might be a 70-30, this one might be an 80-20, okay? Ultimately, because it feeds back up to my main LLC at the top, I have access to everything. My partners would only have access to their individual cell. Legally, if one of these homes and the tenant tries to sue me here, they're locked out of everything else. If this tenant tries to sue me, they're locked out of everything else. Each of these series acts independently like they were their own entity to begin with. Um, it's a little bit more work to create because uh, with each series that we create, we're doing a separate operating agreement for, have to designate ownership for, but this is a wonderful partnering tool for you to help organize and minimize the operating expense of your partnerships in your real estate business. Because if I'm looking for the maximum way to protect each house that I buy, is to create one LLC per partnership, right? And now I'm paying an, an attorney to create a new LLC for me each time. I'm paying my accountant for multiple K-1s each year. I'm paying the state multiple filing fees each year to renew each LLC, right? I have multiple bank accounts for each business. I have multiple tax ID numbers. And if you're not very organized, you can be overwhelmed by the amount of paperwork that's involved in managing three or four LLCs. 
Because of the series LLC, it's all connected back to that main top umbrella LLC. It works fantastic for partnerships and giving you maximum protection, but minimizing the expense and the chaos that comes with multiple entities. Okay? Um, so that's one of the things that we recommend. Yeah, question. On the credit provider's name, mm -hmm is the sole name on the mortgage, right? And then all the partner's names are on the deed? Correct, so the credit partner is only gonna be on the initial recording of the property. Right. As far as the bank's concerned, there's only one person that owns that property, it's the mortgage holder, yeah. right? However, the deed is what we're gonna go by. So after we do the initial recording in the credit partner's name mm -hmm. that funds the transaction up front, we can then go back and change the deed at any point to either a tenants in common, where there's two individuals listed. If Brent had an LLC and I had an LLC, we can list our LLCs as the tenants in common and break up our ownership accordingly that way. We can create a new entity that we own together. And then that entity is what is on title. Okay? Um, so though, definitely we want to make sure that deed transfer happens uh, very quickly after closing. Okay? Because that's what's really going to give you the maximum protection. Um, Another item in here that I want to just introduce to you guys is, is, is uh, estate planning, wills and trusts. Um, they offer also some creditor lawsuit protection, and if you're looking at working with partners more long term, instead of just a short term arrangement, um, that is another way that you can get some additional protection from creditors and lawsuits, in addition upon protecting your family in the event of uh, uh, untimely death, okay? Um, so those are the things that we can be working on uh, simultaneously while we're seasoning funds with somebody if we have to go down that road. Okay? Um, last slide, Nathan. Um, as far as the structuring goes the negotiating, you know, we, Rodney did a great job in recommending some splits. I think those work. I work with those every single time and my clients that have partnered with non-RA stronger mm -hmm. clients have used similar splits because they work. Uh, but ultimately, it's whatever you want to negotiate as a managing partner. As a client, you are going to be designated as the managing partner if you're working with anyone outside of our network. If you're working with amongst each other, this is where we kind of get into a little uh, competition of who's going to claim that managing partner piece. Obviously, it's the most profitable because it involves the most amount of work. Because we have to make sure the expenses are paid every month. We have to make sure that we're the point of contact for our property manager every single month. Okay. Um, now, Rodney mentioned this where he talked about the private lending rates. You know, if we want to instead of treat our capital partner as a full-fledged partner, we might just broker a short-term loan with them. Um, whether it's 6% a year for the use of their money, 10% a year for the use of their money. Another great source of this is anyone that you know with qualified plans, whether it's IRAs, and that could be traditional, simple Roths, that could be 401ks. Um, there is the process of self-directing those funds where now the owner of that account has more control over where it's invested, and if and when that happens, they can then say, you know what, let's use that money now. Um, I can issue a private loan. We have uh, our CEO's son uh, left on a, a church mission for two years, and um, because he was going out of the country, he couldn't obtain financing for a property. They went through and found an individual who had a qualified plan. That qualified plan became the bank, paid for the property up front, they agreed to pay back an X amount of percent of interest per year for the use of that money. And when they sell the property, he's going to get 100% of his principal back because it's secured against the house. Now that allowed our, uh, our CEO's son to go on his, his service that he did, came home, and he came back to a property that had about $60,000 of equity in it. Right? Really cool. So, and I can guarantee that if I'm getting a 3% return on my qualified plan right now, and I can promise them that 6% guaranteed a year, or 8% a year, or 10% a year, um, he's not going to jump at that opportunity, right? And knowing that security is a real asset, so that's something a lot of our clients um, don't realize the power of, is looking for people having these qualified plans that maybe aren't happy with the rates of return they're earning right now, which is crazy because the stock market is at an all-time high, and they're still not earning the rates of return that they probably should be. Um, now, with those retirement funds, there's a number of different ways that we can use those funds to purchase real estate. We can buy homes free and clear. That's the easiest, fastest uh, way to do it, okay? We can also then, with those free and clear properties, we can potentially refinance those. We can, we do have banks that will do uh, non-recourse refinances and help pull some of the equity out of those free and clear properties. That can make sense. Um, and we also have the ability to do some partnerships. 
Um, I'm not going to go into today's meeting, the depth of this. We'll probably do this as a separate meeting for uh, next month. But talking about what's called a joint venture agreement, which is essentially where, as the owner of an account, I can lend money to an outside party, call it 40000 45000 enough to finance the house. That money then seizes in their account, and that person goes in and attains traditional financing. The cash flow from the property pays back the loan as far as the, the simple interest rate that we create. The principal is repaid when we sell the property. Um, and then that IRA is made whole. It's a great, fabulous way that people who do have qualified plans and want to try and get into multiple properties can do it. Now, there's a lot of moving pieces to it. Um, and those are things that we'll discuss in another meeting. Okay? But ultimately, as you look at the protection aspect, realize that you have your own business. That's what real estate is, your business owners. And because of that, we want to make you the most attractive business owner you can to your partners. And so the things that we can do on the front end are things like getting an LLC in place, or the estate planning, or whatever it might be that can make you more attractive to somebody else. They say, you know what, if I have three people to choose from, I'm going to go with this person because they're more organized than what they have done already. Now, we can set up LLCs and partner agreements and tenants and commons and deeds afterwards, you know, if we go the other route where we find our partner first and then do the structuring of it, we can do it that way too. Okay? Ultimately though, uh, it's just what's going to be best for you. And I always say that it's about the path of least resistance. Right? Let's get you to the next property as fast as we can with the least amount of resistance as possible. Okay? So, I know this, we can go a lot more in depth on these topics and we will in future meetings. But hopefully that just gives you some introductory points of what needs to be put in place to help protect these homes against you and your partner. Because that stronger, we believe, is a win-win relationship, and that's what we're out to create at the end of the day. But you could have a situation where a guy that provided the credit might also want to be the manager, so he could even get a higher sure. percentage, right? Mm -hmm. And in that case, or following our traditional breakdown of ownership, it would be a 70-30% split, right? Um, and that could absolutely work. I've had clients that have done that this year where they've used, they've managed it, used their credit and leverage someone else's capital. Now the cool thing is if I go to that capital partner and I issue a private loan with them where I just pay them X percent of interest per year, then I get 100% of the back end growth of the property. I might, he might get a good chunk of the cash flow off the property to satisfy that payment of the interest, but where's the majority of the profits going to be made anyway? So on the back end equity growth of these homes, like hers, that's grown 25 to 30 percent in the last year, right? So there's a number of different ways that we can create those win-win relationships where it profits the other person and you profit as well. Good question. Yes. So you mentioned that Strongwork has attorneys that can help you set up LLCs. Uh -huh. Is that part of your PSA, or is that? An additional charge? The, the connection work? is part of the PSA, but there's an additional charge for the creation fee because we have to use their time and expertise to create the new entity. Okay? Um, regular LLCs, um, our team charge is six fifty, dollars uh, plus whatever the state fees and where we decide to create that entity. Um, if we go with the series LLC, it's $12.49, uh, and then whatever the state fee is. Now, I look at that. Um, the $12.49 on a series LLC actually gives you the first four series. Um, and essentially you're getting those last two for free. Because if I do two separate individual LLCs, I'm paying $1,300. Um, we checked around. Um, if you're using uh, a paralegal to create an entity, they're going to charge you a minimum of $500. We've had some clients tell us that attorneys are charged to create a regular LLC as high as 1000 So we feel like we're, we're very uh, nicely priced for our clients to still get the benefit. I have an attorney that understands what our objectives are with our clients. And uh, it's a great service for our clients that have taken advantage of that. So the basic basic thing that the attorneys help you with is creating the, the rules or the... The operating the agreement is like the glue that holds the business together. And that's what the attorney is creating. You know, any one of us can go online to the state of Utah, for example, and register and create an entity, right? Utah is a very easy way to do that. You pay the state fee. And, and in theory, in the, in the next 10, 15 minutes, we could create a new entity. But it's the operating agreement that you want to make sure is protected. And when I'm dealing with a partnership, I'd rather spend an extra few hundred dollars up front to know that I'm protected on the back end of tens of thousands. Right. And that's a legal agreement. Yep. And the other thing to remember, though, a lot of your legal expenses are also tax, de tax deductible. Now, I always recommend that you go to a certified public account, CPA, an accountant, to help you with those deductions. The legal fees, professional services, 
which are legal and accounting fees, are also tax deductible, including your PSA that you paid for to become a member and a client. That is also a tax deductible expense. So in my mind, I'm going to get that back anyway as a deduction. I'm more than willing to pay the price to work with the experts to make sure it's done right up front. Yeah. Did you mention earlier that an LLC can buy property? Is it an entity? It can, only if we're buying it cash. Oh, okay. That's good. Yes, because if we're financing, initial financing recording has to take place in the person's credit that we're using. You can't do it alone. It cannot be alone. The LLC cannot recommend an LLC. That is, that is one of those things that went away with the recession, unfortunately. Okay, now, um, with, to do this uh, as a partner, why would a partner want to just purchase a property outright? Because you lose your leverage. Well, if I look at that, I can get 100% of a property that we have a free and clear, or if I don't get a property right now, I have 100% of zero, right? Again, leverage is always going to get you more properties, and in the end, it's going to realize higher rates of return. But if my only option is to maybe partner with someone's qualified plan to get a free and clear property, I'll do that all day long because it's one more house I didn't have before. Well, right. because you didn't have to have the credit and whatnot to do it. Now again, if you're not in a position where you have the capital to go buy a free... It's not who you know, it's who they know, right? And so if you can tap into somebody's market, you've got resources there. And so always be on the lookout and, and assess the, the different resources that you've got. Um, and I think the, the best place to start is with your project manager, the PSA that you've got, because you have put some resources into it yourself. And uh, it, you know, there there is a price to it, and um, and you've purchased that relationship with Strongbrook. So I'm just gonna leave you with, you know, just kind of thinking along those lines, just to to esteem what you've got with us a little higher, and realize that you have a wealth of resources at your disposal, and you know, I'd, I'd advocate that uh, that you take advantage of that. Thanks, Hal. <clears throat> All right, I hope this was helpful. So we're at 8 o'clock right now. Um, those that need to leave, we got started a little bit uh, late, are welcome to. We won't be offended, I promise. But uh, um, real quick, we just wanted to bring Clint uh, Benson up. Clint, and Clint, you want to have the hot seat or do you want to stand? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so, you know, um, Clint and Wiley, how long have you been clients at Strongbrook here? Seven months. Seven months. and. In that you know they they are very active IBDs and and they're very active on the real estate side as well. They work actually very closely with Rodney. Rodney's their project manager. Um, but they just had a partnership that you just completed. Is it is the property transferred into your LLC yet? Um, yes, it's got so you're yeah. so you're pretty much um, you you got it done and, and you're rolling along. So yeah. can you maybe just tell us a little bit of why you did that and your experience with that real briefly? Uh, I didn't have to do it. I had the money and the credit, and uh, I just did it for the education. And I know I'm going to end up doing it eventually anyway, partnering. And so I, I just thought, well, I'll jump in and and uh, and try it out. And you introduced me to my partner, and uh, we uh, uh, decided. No, I didn't want to partner with anyone until I knew him real well. And so we went out to lunch, and we gave each other homework to do a what if list. What happens if any anything that might come up, you know, that might cost money in the partnership or whatever? And we came up with the same list, almost identical. And we're just a, I mean, it was you guys introduced us. You knew it would be a good fit. So a good fit. You felt yeah. comfortable. I was. I'm very comfortable with the person. He's a, a client. Uh, we negotiated for percentages. I just did the credit. Mm -hmm. And. Um, what and, and so just you're you're not the managing partner though they no. they wanted to be that yeah I'll let I let them do that and and I was talking to Clint and uh, and Wileen about this they didn't really want to have the hands on about this and so it was an advantage to them to just to say hey it's nice to have someone else that's going to manage it that they felt good about that they're going to be able to check in with and, and work with the other the other advantage and I hope this is okay to say this Clint is that it allowed them to actually stretch out their money and to and to actually get 
more properties down the road than just the one that they were actually you know focusing on right now so right. there was a little bit of strategic planning with that and yep. it made sense and it was a win-win situation for for both you and your business partner and i have another partner now uh, that i'm seasoning money with okay and uh and going from that and great and i've got there's a lot of partners out there so. excellent it's easy i'm learning and i like it so i like partnering awesome yes thank you how did you choose um, where to buy? You didn't do the Utah home, did you? Did you I did, uh, uh, yeah, I did uh, Casa Grande. There you go. Uh, I, just, um, I, I just wanted something closer, like Vegas or Arizona, mm -hmm. for my first home. So I just went with, uh, with the house, the, you know, the, the properties they gave me to look at. I just, I didn't even look to Vegas or Arizona, I just looked at the property itself some research on the area and stuff. Mm -hmm. I liked it. What was the relevance of, of vicinity to you? Um, do you plan on no. going there? Or no, I, I do go through Arizona. It's just close to home. Okay, so just, yeah. just, my just for your own home. As, as yeah, yeah, for my okay. first home. I plan on doing Orlando. I plan on okay. doing so other places. Vicinity. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Don't, you don't need to be there unless you are I'm that part of it. probably never see the call. Great, um, thank you, Clint. I appreciate right. that. Um, any, and, and this is where, if we could have all the co uh, the project managers actually just come up and and this is kind of any last questions that you have, you know, for us. And I want to just add one last thing as well. You know, when if you're IBDs, and I think I think everybody here, and I think a lot of our guests on the phone are IBDs as well. Um, this is one thing that I talk to my clients about. If you're an IBD and you're out, you know, uh, pitching Strongbrook and the opportunities here. If you have someone that maybe isn't interested in a PSA, maybe they're interested in the real estate, um, you can bring that, that person that as a potential partner onto your meeting with, with one of our project managers. And we can talk to them just like we talk to you about the opportunity, what we're getting into. We can go over markets and, and property examples, run through the numbers so that you're not having to bear all the burden of that. Um, you know, as part of uh, one of your, your meetings with us, we can take the time to actually, you know, talk to, to a, a potential partner that you're looking at, at uh, moving forward with. And, and sometimes that's very helpful, Rodney. And one thing that we forgot to mention also is that only the management partner is required to have a PSA. The other, you know, the money and credit partner, as long as, um, you know, the one that's gonna be interacting with us and according to the transaction, you know, management stuff, if they're a PSA holder, you're good. And if you have an unlimited PSA, then you can have unlimited partnerships because you can be managed partner again and again and again for any number of other clients, other partners, I mean. Go ahead. What kind of resources we got if we want to be the management, but we don't want to be managing and afraid that we would not do that very well or we're not experienced in or whatever. But there are resources that can be Let's clarify what management really means. So management just means that you are the point of contact for that property. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's in a place like Phoenix, you know, we're well aware that we have teams there that are doing the property management, all that kind of stuff. So there isn't really that much for you to worry about. It means you'll be making the high level investment decisions. You'll be the one consulting with us on the right time to refinance or sell the property or things of that nature. That's all it means. And, oh. then, and then just the ongoing accounting and bookkeeping stuff. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but that changes if you're buying property locally or yes, something like that. Yes, and, it, the, and the bookkeeping part is always <coughs> going to be part of it. Yes, like bookkeeping is always and, part of it. Yep. And accounting that way. And again, you know, we'd want you to consult with your CPA and legal team so they can streamline that through as much as possible. But you're correct. If you're buying it outside of our hot market areas, you know, there's five areas that we do real estate very heavily in. There's, there's Phoenix. Las Vegas, Orlando, Memphis, Tennessee, and Indianapolis. If it's gonna be anywhere else, we can find agents for you. We can try to you know, get you a good deal there, um, but you know, you're know, you gonna to have to figure out managing it yourself. And so it's a different process. I would areas. just say too, I mean, when, when you come on to Strongbrook and you're buying, <coughs> you're an investor and you're becoming a business owner. Now, just to put that into context, sometimes that's kind of like overwhelming for people like, hey, what, what about managing this? What does that look like? It's not like you're managing or overseeing a retail store where you have tons of transactions and things like that. When you look at it, you have a property, you have a monthly rent payment coming in, maybe 
a vacancy or a repair that you're dealing with here and there. So um, it's up to us to set up that, well, we could even set the whole thing where it's automatic. Yes, right, yes. It comes in. Yes. What's left over for the management team? Yes. Mm -hmm. That comes in. And, and then it. from that account, and they looked into an account, from <coughs> that account, the uh, mortgage automatically comes out. And then if I'm in a partnership, which we're talking about here, mm -hmm. then that difference between the mortgage and the rent after the management, management, you know, those that are doing it back there in Arizona, mm -hmm. that is split up accordingly. Maybe they get it per month. And that would be my my responsibility. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's what like when Anthony was talking about an op operating agreement. There's there's some strategies with taxes and things like that that you can put in place as far as. And I hang on to that information, and that report goes to my CPA. Exactly. Yeah. And, Got it. And if one specific partner has a need for more cash flow, because for example they borrowed money from another source, used for the down payment or something, you can negotiate however you want in your partnerships. You can negotiate one party to get the cash flow or to get more of the cash flow even though they're not that big of a, an owner of interest in the property. So you can you can set it up any number of ways for the benefit of the partners. The strong growth will keep us out of trouble in that one and make it so that everybody feels good about it and yeah. sees the benefits. It, it'll be a collaboration effort between your strong power team and your project manager and your attorney and your legal counsel. That's my coach, by the way. <laughs> so Nathan, um, earlier you talked about LLCs and Series LLCs, and you focused on attorneys that can help you set up uh, operating agreements, primarily um, for protection purposes. Um, the list of attorneys that you have that work with you, do they understand, do they have a tax background? Because taxes and protection are two different things and yet you've got to work them yes. together in yes. order to minimize the taxes that you would have as a business. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about the people that you have. Yeah, so we, we do, we have some good attorneys and CPAs that we can refer you to. Um, if you're working with them directly, like Anthony said, we, we, we uh, have the, the service and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a charge to do that to get it set up where we have our, our internal attorneys. Well, they're not internal, but the attorneys that we use uh, to oversee that process and so forth. So when you're talking about taxes and, and legal though, you're, you're still wanting to go to two separate professionals, a CPA for your taxes and then, and then an attorney. Now you have a tax attorney, but a tax attorney is not gonna be specialized in real estate like, like what you want. But the nice thing is, is we can help bring those two exactly. together. Mm -hmm. So they're speaking to each other and not working against each other. Okay, that's that's my concern because when you're functioning in your own specialized realm, yes. you get tunnel vision yes. sometimes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, go ahead. Okay, so I'm just a late 20s male. I don't know the first thing about real estate. So when I got here, maybe it's because I was on the phone making sure that they could get here. I missed maybe the first two, five minutes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what CPA is, IBD. I, I, I picked up, asking him a question what yeah. PSA is. Yeah. I question. don't know anything that went on here almost. I picked up a lot of things that just made sense because I knew terms that I kind of followed mm -hmm. a lot of things. Some of real estate makes sense. Yeah. But, but, I, but I don't know. This isn't real estate 10 times like I thought it was going to be. This is real estate second or third semester. Yeah. And I don't really know what's going yeah. on. Yeah. No, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, maybe I can just talk to one of you guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you're welcome to. Yeah. Everyone else in this room is actually one of our clients that has already purchased what we call PSA, which is a client relationship with us. So they've had a lot of education and background. So you're kind of a prospective client or a potential partner. And so it's natural you have a lot of those questions that we can address those. And potential and partner, when becoming a partner, would that be an IBD? I, I don't know what's what. I, I I, know. An, an IBD All stands for independent business developer. So Clint, for example, he and his wife are IBDs. They're very successful IBDs. It means that you, um, you know, you're in the business of referring clients to the company, which you're paid very well for, actually. Let's kind of do a quick side conversation. Yeah. 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 That, that'd be good. Let, me, let me take some time for our guests on the phone. Do, do you have any questions for us? I'll take the silence as a no. We can <laughs> mute them, did we? Yeah, I, I hope not. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're still there. So we can Okay. okay. What's that? Oh, this is Peter. Hey, Peter, how are you? Hey, great, great, great. Hey, any um, cautionary notes on um, um, you know uh, violating any kind of securities laws about the way you talk to people about money in terms of. Uh, you know, things you should say or shouldn't say? Um, 
Um, any, you guys have any insight to that? I went, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, <coughs> I had a little bit of a document on some notes I took uh, a while back. Let's see. Where is it? Uh, I'm talking to her. Uh, I, got a, I was listening to a talk by her Lane Lender talking about going out and finding partners you need to be careful of as it relates to uh, not violating uh, uh, you know, securities laws. <coughs> I've, I've got uh, one thing that you might want to keep in mind is avoid um, promising specific returns. Um, to, you know, you say somebody, hey, I've got this great thing, you know, we're getting, you know, 22% returns, you know, avoid that kind of number talk. Um, Related to the property. Right, right. But if you're talking about in a partnership saying, hey, I want to borrow some money from you and I want to do it and I'm going to pay you X percent for the use of that money, you know, that's where you can be very specific. But yeah, if you're talking about the performance of the investment, use more generalities. And then we can show specific property examples to say this is what this property has done. Um, to help kind of get around that. That's a great point, Kyle. Yeah, um, Peter, Peter, real quick, were you finished saying what you were gonna say there? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, one other red flag that I've um, heard of is having too many partners involved. Like if you're collecting 500 bucks, you know, from like 50 different people, that's gonna look really fishy. So, you know, you wanna simplify and have as few partners as necessary. The other thing too, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of years at Fidelity Investments and Retirement Planning. Kyle and I both did, actually. And I know like Anthony and some other of us have been in, you know, financial planning type of things. And when we're talking to our clients, I mean, we're, we're very good about giving options and, and information that we have scrubbed and make sure it's accurate. And then that gives you, as the client, the pos in a position to make some good decisions. So you have good options, good information in front of you. That's the job and that's the role that we try to play. And, and you know, I, I don't know that as an IBD you need to take on a lot of, of um, you know, responsibility in trying to figure that out necessarily. Um, you know, it's fairly simple when you're forming a, a business relationship and a partnership. Things are pretty straightforward. Um, I like what Rodney said, if you get a lot of people involved in an LLC, that starts to become a little bit less, less desirable when it comes to the SEC and so forth, so. At that point, you'd need a securities license yeah. or something it's, like that. Just found my notes, the bullet points here that I wrote down were do not advertise, do not promise, do not compare to other investments. Uh, you can't say your business, is, your business raises money. Uh, disclose, disclose, disclose. Uh, establish a relationship with respective money partner through a questionnaire or an interview. Uh, no license required for home deals with no commissions. Yeah, I'd agree with those things. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Good question, though. Yeah, and of course, in this case, you know, there's no commissions involved because you're just an owner versus an agent getting a commission or yeah. something. Okay. At what point do we uh, bring this potential partner to Stromberg and you know, let, let you guys do what you do? So I quit messing it up. So so basically, <laughs> like it up up to that point. if you found someone that, that you think would be a good potential partner, um, it's kind of nice if they have more of a background in our company. You know, it's good that you bring people to events or show them our website so they can get more familiar with what we do. Um, but either way, um, it's your partner, and so you're kind of the conduit between that person and our company. You have access to us through your by virtue of your PSA. You have command of our time. That person doesn't really, you know, we're all, you know, we're busy enough that we can't just spend endless time with everyone in the world. We have to be, you know, particular about it, but they can access us through you. And so, you know, they can, they can be on joint calls between you and us. And then, you know, you can get that information together or they can ask you other questions they may have that you wouldn't know. I would say if they're, if they're fairly serious about it and, and they want to pursue it further, make an appointment and bring them in. So. One of the things to, to prepare for before you <clears throat> bring a partner in, um, and it just be in your best interest to get as familiar with the process and with us as you can, and so you know what's you know what what all, all the hoops are that you, you have to jump through, and and so you 
have a, a working familiarity with what you're doing. We've got a lot of resources online that you can access with the Strongbrook Academy. You know, I would say go back and, and kind of revisit some of that. And so you really know to what you're doing. That's great, Pamela. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of resources. And, and if you're partnering and looking for clients outside of Strongbrook, you want to be as knowledgeable as possible. You want to study everything. You want to ask your project manager for examples of current properties because you know you want to um, you know to be excited about what we're doing, understand what we're doing, and then that makes it easier to find partners and develop those relationships. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Uh, any last questions before we wrap up then? So uh, the with the attorneys um, and CPAs that you have that you can refer people to. Um, have you pre-negotiated uh, um, fees with them in the same manner that you negotiate with property managers? Because you're giving them volume business. Yeah. Are they? Yeah, we refer we refer a lot of clients over to them, and uh, and, and yeah, we, we we have a you know a fee. They we know their fees, and we can for most services can tell you what they would be. So. Oh. If it's something out of the box. Okay, so then, then, okay. um, oh, I just came, came into my mind and left. Um, so I forgot what I was going to ask. So I'll, I'll defer. Shoot us an email. <laughs> yeah, shoot your project manager an email and they'll get right on it. You know our number, Peter. <laughs> sure. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so. All right, hey, we appreciate your time. I hope it was of value to everyone. Um, we will probably do this again in, in, like I said, three or four weeks where we probably start exploring a little bit more in depth some of the retirement plan options. When you start looking at partnerships like Anthony was talking about and where money is at, there is a lot of retirement money out there. Um, and there's a lot of people that are dissatisfied with the way that the market, speaking of the stock market, has been. And, and we see as, our, as project managers, a lot of retirement money coming out of the market and coming into real estate. And so, you know, there's there's good opportunity with that. Um, we'll do this to help brush things up and have new clients come on board as well. So thank you for your time. Yeah, really quick. The next step is um, if you're interested more in partnering internally, you know, we talk about a partner externally and you can work with your project manager more closely on that. But but if you're interested in partnering internally with other strong yes. clients, Definitely send your project manager an email, let them know you're interested and which resource you have. And they'll probably know based on your situation what it would be, but let them know that. Um, you know, that way we have your permission to put you on a contact list and then we can send that contact list to people that have the opposite need and vice versa. We'll send you the other need and then you can, you can call one another and work out mutually beneficial relationships. So if you're doing internal partnering, um, and, and you purchase a property through the partnering program, that counts as one of your properties if you purchase the PSA and only allows you four, is that correct? Yes, and it would count for whichever you as a managing partner, getting that piece of the pie would count toward a transaction for them, both in terms of counting for their PSA slots if they have a limited membership, um, and also it would count toward their IBD credits as well. Yeah, remember my question. Can, can somebody from Colorado do a series LLC? Yeah, I don't think Colorado, it, the state itself, offers a series. However, you can set up a, a series LLC through the states that actually offer that. And, and There's 14 that. states and territories that you can create a series LLC in. And you can create it uh, in a different state than you reside, and there's no issues with that. Cool. All right. Are you advantage to like Nevada or Delaware? So, yes and no. So Delaware has an own entity clause, which means that the registered agent that's representing the, the entity keeps your, protect, keeps your identities uh, protected. Uh, Nevada has the same own entity clause, but Nevada also has no state income tax. So that's why Nevada is very uh, popular for a lot of people to set up entities in. Now, Utah doesn't have the own entity clause, doesn't have state income tax, but it's very, uh, favorable state for fees, expenses, um, and when I look at the difference, you know, of Nevada 
unless you're running some major uh, capital through it where, you're, where you would be paying taxes anyway, because with off your real estate, you're gonna have enough deductions off your depreciation, mortgage interest, uh, expenses. You're really not gonna have any reported income anyway um, to, be, to pay taxes on. So Nevada can make sense. And if you say, hey, because eventually I wanna to get to that point where I'm getting more income than I'm writing off in expenses, Nevada definitely makes more sense. The state fees are more in Nevada. You're about 400 a year to register your entity in Nevada. Can I get a series LLC through Nevada if I'm not a resident, because somebody yes. said, yeah, yeah, you know, you said that, but somebody told me before that you have to have somebody there doing it. You have to have, you have to have a registered agent that has brick and mortar location in Nevada. No and we have that. Okay, good. Is there no attrition when you have uh, been going along with a series LLC in Utah, you decide, I think that it's more beneficial to be in a series LLC in another state to transfer that over? Is there any attrition or loss there? You would have yeah, to read. Fees. You'd have to redo the entire entity okay. for that same yeah, redo the entire entity. Mm -hmm. Good question. Anthony, I'll just throw this in as one last plug here too. And this is something that, that we really feel strongly about. When we're looking at, you know, becoming investors and business owners, you know, the foundational pieces to that include, you know, asset and liability protection, of course, is what is what we use the LLCs for. But another big part of that is estate planning. And so that would include like your trust and your will. Um, and so we it, and we actually just created a, a package deal. If you're if you're buying you know purchasing an, an LLC and an estate plan, you'd actually get a, a twenty percent discount uh, off the, the purchase of both of those. So so that's just something to, to keep in mind as you talk with your project manager. Yes. So um, I know the LLC is primarily for protection, but if you're a, both a PSA and an IBD, and you um, can you run um, the IBD business through the same LLC as um, the, the property? The, the property, or do you have to have? You two can separate? under a series LLC. You can designate one of those series for your IBD business. Um, if you're doing a standard LLC, you'd want to keep that separated from your properties. The the thing to be careful about is that the IRS treats active income such as IBD commissions versus passive income like real estate in you know just residual income very differently and so you have to keep those very very different in and so you're, that's kind of a cpa question as well i actually use different llc's for both because i don't like commingling the two because they're taxed very differently Other questions? great okay. all right well thank you for your time we appreciate this um and uh we'll go ahead and conclude thank you okay. thank you thank you so, Ronnie, you own several properties. Do you. you have a series LLC or do you so just have you don't mind if I can pull you in that? Yeah, a few series LLCs for those good yeah. yeah. It's just easier. Um, and having